introduce what we're planning to do um, in this session. So we're going to look at, uh, first of all, OU modules are in fact digital by design, so that makes things a lot easier for us. Um, and then um, Alison will be talking about um, acquiring digital content and um, using an embedding, and then I'll be talking a bit about the using and the embedding of the digital content, and then um, finally we'll have a quick, quick look at how we support student use of the digital content. Right, so all Open University modules are based on a module website on Moodle, which is our VLE, and um, I'm sure um, that's pretty much the case for any other university that may not use Moodle, but another VLE. Um, even though a surprising proportion of our modules have print materials as well, the core of any module is online, and this makes the task of integrating library e-resources much easier for us. Although with many universities now going online, you may find that um, you've also got a, a big opportunity to integrate um, library resources where you didn't have it before. So um, it's certainly um, something to start working with your academics on now. Our modules are put together by a multidisciplinary team, which includes academic authors, um, editors, intermediate, um, and all sorts of designers graphic designers, people like that, as well as the um, librarian who's also assigned to a module. Um, the modules can, um, usually take something like 18 months to two years to make, so um, it's, it's not um, a, 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 a quick process um, designing for online. And the modules will also contain a variety of media, and authors will often use third-party content to enrich their writing. At this stage, they need to investigate whether they use library content or whether they pay for the rights to use the content, um, which may come from some other third party on, um, out of um, in the big wide world, rather than just writing it themselves. So um, we're going to talk a bit about the process of how we actually acquire this content, and I'm going to hand you over to Alison now to tell you a bit more about that. Okay, thanks Fiona. Um, yes, as Fiona says, I'm going to um, tell you a bit more about how we acquire the digital content. Um, as she said, um, the route for identifying content required for teaching is usually from information provided by module teams and the work that the academic liaison libra librarians do with those groups. Um, this can be quite specific requirements, um, for example, a particular book, or it can be a more general request for content on particular subjects. Um, with several suggested potential resources. Uh, in the content and licensing team, we ask the academic liaison team questions about the request, which include things like needing information about exactly how the resource is going to be used in the teaching. Um, for example, is it an essential part of the teaching or assessment, or is it just simply some background reading? We also need to know the likely number of people needing to make use of the resource and when it will need, be needed by. Once we have that information, um, we start the investigation part of the process. Um, we look at the available sources for the resource. So is it available from one supplier or is it available from several suppliers? Is it available as an individual item or is it only available as part of a bigger package? Is it available direct from the supplier or, for example, can we buy it as part of a national agreement such as um, JISC subscription services? Um, have we purchased from any of the suppliers that it comes from before? And do we have an existing, um, any existing content from those suppliers that will make other parts of the acquisition process easier? Um, at that point, we then go on to an assessment phase where we assess the resource um, and the different options. Once we have several or a single potential source for the resource, we move, we move to assess it. Um, where we can, we will buy the products as part of a national deal. So, for example, if there is a GIST deal, we might investigate that further and, and go via that route, or from an existing supplier. Cost for the resource is an important factor, but as well as that, it's the licenses available for the resource. The license dictates many of the elements of how we can use the resource and what we can do with it in the teaching, so forms a significant part of our assessment work. Once we have selected a single source, we 
request a copy of the license agreement and get a trial for the product. We aim to have at least a 30-day trial as it can take time to contact academic staff to let them know that they can look at the product and feedback on its suitability. Obviously, as you've heard from Hossam and Bev earlier as well, we need time to assess the accessibility of the resource. Um, and we use a checklist to assess the license while we have the trial running and follow up with the provider if there's anything that doesn't match our usual requirements. Um, we will also negotiate with the supplier on price appropriate, um, possibly over the length of the contract and annual price increases. Once we're happy um, with feedback from the trial and that the license is going to be suitable, um, we're move, we'll move on to purchasing. Uh, we set up details of the order for the resource on our acquisition system, um, which is Ex Libris's Alma, and ensure we have committed funds for the resource. If we are buying from a supplier who is new to us, we also have to involve our finance department to add them as a vendor, and they do their own acceptance checks. At that point, if they're not happy, then we can't use that supplier. Um, we get the purchase request authorised by a director of the library, order, and then request the invoice for the product. Then we move to the access phase of acquisitions. If we've done a trial for the product, we will already set up access for the resource, um, but we have to make that more publicly available often um, so that um, students and other people can see it more widely. And we'll set all that up. If we haven't had a trial, then we have to make sure we set up the access. Um, we make sure the resource is working in our discovery service, which is Ex Libris's Primo, and on any links in the library web pages. We then also pass all the details to the academic liaison librarians to let them know the resource is live, and they'll sort out specific links in the module websites. Before we renew any resource that we have bought previously, we also assess the use by staff and students across the university by looking at usage statistics and um, other feedback we may have had. We then create a content review report each annual review period, um, which includes information about why it was purchased and how it is intended to be used. What I'll tell you now is a bit more about some specific examples, um, some case studies of particular things we've actually gone through this process for. One of them, one of the examples is JOVE. Um, you may or may not know about JOVE. Um, JOVE stands for the Journal of Visualized Experiments. Um, it's a collection of lots of different videos explaining scientific um, experiments, um, showing exactly how they're done, usually by the person who's done the experiment. And they also have a selection of science education videos, which are kind of interactive video textbooks. Um, Jove is a good example of the complexities of buying content in subject collections. Um, in August last year, we had some academics in an engineering module who expressed an interest in using some particular videos from the Jove video journal. It actually isn't possible to buy individual Jove videos, um, and the videos they had identified, the engineering modules, came from three different subject collections. So we knew that this was going to require a significant investment in both time and possibly money. Um, we did have a small amount of content from Jove already um, that we'd purchased in 2013, so we had some relationship with the supplier. We contacted them to investigate the options for the different videos that people were interested in and to look at potential collections and costs. We arranged a trial for all of the Jove platform as we suspected um, that if the STEM faculty were made aware of a trial, interest would be across several disciplines and not just limited to engineering. Unfortunately, at the time, it was difficult to get faculty to feedback because the trial um, was co coinciding with some industrial action. Um, however, um, as we could see the potential of the content, we were able to get another short trial later. Um, those that did look at it could see it was a useful product, and we also got Jove to visit the library to ask us more questions about using the product. Um, Eventually, we gathered enough interest to support a purchase and selected a range of subject areas to suit our teaching. 
we were able to purchase the collection before the end of the year. So although it took several months, we got there in the end. Um, and we've actually had some feedback, further feedback. Now we've got it, as people are becoming aware of it, that actually the STEM faculty are really pleased with, with having the access. Um, another example of where assessment can influence our purchase is um, access engineering. And um, we'd had some interest from some technology modules in engineering for this particular collection in 2018. We organised a trial for late December 2018 and we had McGraw-Hill in to visit us in spring 19, 2019 to discuss the product and the trial feedback. Unfortunately, there were some queries around the accessibility of the content, and when we explained that to the publisher, they explained they were planning to fix these issues when they updated the site. So we decided to wait until the product was available in its new version, and then trialled again in October 2019. The trial this time was successful, and we purchased the collection in November, adding it to the McGraw-Hill content we already have via a GIST deal, which meant because we'd already got some content, we got a 15% discount. Um, sometimes purchasing things can be quite complex. Um, in the case of Spring and HRE books, we frequently have been asked by STEM faculty for individual Springer book titles, and this has been going on for several years. Um, they don't sell their e-books individually very often, um, apart from through a few um, ag aggregators now, but that not many of their titles. But they do sell them in subject collections by year, and that often meant buying titles that we didn't want or need with the ones we did. Um, we found out that Spring and Nature offered an evidence-based access model for their e-books called My Collection, which could help us with that. What we found is we could lease titles from several subject collections we suspected the STEM faculties might want to buy from for a range of years, it's three years, um, over 12 months. So you've got three years of content, so 17, 18, 19 for a 12 month period. And then at the end of the year, you can buy the titles that the people have most been using, using the money we put down for the cost of the lease. This has been a huge success for us over the last three years and means we're now able to offer options for purchasing recent Springer titles in STEM as individual e-books. It also gives the students a range of titles that they can have access to and their interest in many of the undergraduate books leads us to buying those titles too, which is giving them um, a say in the library's purchasing decisions. Um, I'll pass you back to Fiona now to continue the rest of the presentation. <laughs> right, thanks. Um, so um, you've now heard um, how we actually go about acquiring some of our digital content. And so at this point, um, an academic liaison librarian works with academic authors to identify suitable content. And um, each um, module team that is in production has an academic liaison librarian assigned to work with them throughout the production process. And um, the academic li liaison librarian will advise on library content at the beginning of the production, which could be of interest to the authors. And um, they'll also actively look for new content, or if the academic authors identify new content, we'll also liaise with the e-content advisors about what we what we can get hold of and um, obviously uh, there are budgetary considerations um, doing this as well. Um, using library resources does not represent any um, cost to the module team so um, it's quite a popular option for them to use library content in a module because obviously the um, library costs are uh, sort of um, across the university. So it can be a useful way of enriching the content of a module and um, it's the job of the academic liaison librarian to make sure that the academics aware, are aware of this. However, um, one of the things we, the librarian also needs to be aware of, and again this is how we work with the content advisors, is in what are the license conditions for the um, digital content. So we need to make sure that um, the license conditions permit the use that the author wants and um, this is sometimes a bit of a problem if they want to use e-books for example. So um, some e-books we can only purchase on um, 
a license which, um, for example, uh, only allowed, say, 320 accesses in one particular year. And some of our modules have got um, a lot of students on them. We may have a thousand students on some of the level one modules. So um, a license which only allows 325 accesses in one year is obviously going to be no use to us at all. So the gold standard of an e-book, for example, is unlimited access. And that's what we're always looking for when we're going to be buying our e-books. And in the case of um, if we're actually going to be using an e-book or an e-book chapter in a module, then we really need to make sure that we have unlimited access and that um, we own the book rather than just <coughs> renting it from somewhere like um, eBook Central, for example. And in some cases, we may well decide to um, spend a bit more money on an eBook so that we can get unlimited access rather than just um, a say 320 um, accesses in one year and some ebooks are really limited um, they may only have one um, person accessing it and that's really not a model which is very suitable for use with our students when it comes to things like um, e-journals and articles they're usually not such a problem because um, they're usually unlimited access where it, it's really things like the e-books that we need to keep an eye on. And we use a lot of um, different kinds of content. So it's not just books and um, journals. We also have um, music, we have images, we have British standards, for example. We have um, and various um, audiovisual databases with videos, which um, can either be linked to from a module or in some cases can even be embedded into the module. And that's really good if we can do that, but it's not always the case. Um, we also need to make sure that if we're giving students um, library content that they can actually use it or they know or they can find out how to use it because sometimes the databases or a particular piece of content might not be um, very intuitive so um, we um, have some activities for example using um, the newspaper database nexus can be a bit tricky so we actually have all, um, activities which have been authored by members of the authoring team in the library, which um, explain to students how to use the newspaper database and the, um, and the advantages of using them as well. So um, we have a bank of these activities which we can just slot into a module and um, then the, um, we can perhaps write a bit of wraparound text explaining um, why the, the, the student's going to be using that particular resource and then also the instructions on how to use it. Um, sometimes um, we'll just work with the academic and the editor for a particular module to um, create the content that um, you know that helps the students to use the the resource. And um, obviously, in, we we really try hard to make sure that if we're going to be embedding library content, that it's not just a, an add-on, that it's actually going to be part of the module, and that the students will seamlessly think, oh, I'm going to have to access this because I need to know this rather than this is a good thing because it's um, I'm learning how to use the library because we find that um, students generally tend to only do things that help them with um, their actual study of the module and the content rather than trying to do good things capital G capital T so the academic liaison librarian is working to embed content and also to make sure that the students can use the content um, with um, appropriate skills activities So um, I'm just going to um, show you a couple of examples of um, how we um, have embedded um, some activities. So this is using a British standard which the students um, have to find themselves from the British Standards Online Database. Um, it's part of um, um, an introductory engineering module and in this the students are looking at materials and um, they're, in particular they're looking at materials in the context of toys and so um, they're asked to find um, the standard for toy trampolines in this particular case 
and then they're asked to um, look at the standard and define various parts of um, the standard in context with the materials that they're thinking about. So this is um, a, it's a library resource, they have to go to the library to find it, but um, it's actually part of the module and it's um, something that they're, it's very much integrated into what they're doing at that particular moment in their study. So um, this is an example of um, an activity which I've been working on recently with um, the new mechanical engineering module which goes into presentation in October this year actually. And um, I'm working with the academic in charge of the module and also with the editor who's making sure that the module will go up in a reasonably coherent way on um, the VLE. And this activity is looking at um, hyperloops as a form of transportation and the module team chair knows that in the next six or eight years however long the module is running things will change with hyperloops or po possibly change with hyperloops so she wants the um, students to do an activity looking at um, how the hyperloop system has developed in the year that they're actually studying and to do that, they're going to be searching the Nexus newspaper database, which as you may well know if you use it, is quite a, a complicated database, to put it mildly. So um, we slot in an activity which we've already got written for Nexus. And because that's a library activity and is not held as part of the module material, we actually have editing access to it. So if Nexus changes its interface, which it's done several times recently, then we can change the instructions um, with, uh, for the students. Um, you can also see that um, I, I wrote this activity, it then went off to the module team chair and the editor, and they came back with lots of comments and lots of um, ideas. And it's, it's really rewarding working with the module teams in this way because um, an activity that you've written, they think they're all, all thinking of different things, different ways the students might use it. And, to, and together we create an activity which um, is much better than, um, than if I'd just um, written it myself and then put it up up on the module. So it, it's good to work with um, these other people and um, create an activity together in a collaborative way. And that's very much how open university modules are put together, actually. There's lots of reds and underlinings here. <laughs> So that's um, integrating the module material. Um, I suppose we're finally just going to have a look at um, how we actually support it. With um, over 500 databases, things do go wrong every now and then, not surprisingly. And uh, we usually find out when students contact the library help desk. And uh, if a resource is being used in an activity, for example, then this can create quite a lot of um, inquiries. Librarians on the help desk um, We'll all do a bit of e-resources troubleshooting uh, when they first get inquiries like this. They'll test the resource, see if they can resolve the problem, if there's a problem for them, or if perhaps it's just a problem for the student because of their setup. If they can't solve the problem, then they will pass it on to the e-resources team, who will then um, perhaps work with the library systems team to see why um, a, the particular resource isn't working correctly. Um, the problems are usually caused by something the publisher has done because um, they're forever updating their databases and you know that, that that's you know presumably um, something that they have to do anyway but um, sometimes it causes problems with our authentication systems or it may cause other problems as well so um, the e-resources team have um, really good relationships with um, the different um, publishers and um, they can usually contact um, somebody in the um, in who supplies the database and we'll work together to try and see why a particular resource is causing problems. So um, finally, um, we have the digital skills activities, which I've mentioned, which um, the uh, uh, which we can either slot into modules, or if students are having particular difficulties, like for example, a law student with um, the law databases, we also have activities. Um, which um, 
show students how to use things like um, Westlaw and um, Lexis. So we, we have ways of um, giving the students the information about using the e-resources as well as helping them if they've got problems. Uh, we also run regular library training sessions on how to use um, databases and e-books. So we have um, one called Smarter Searching with Library Databases. And um, we also have another one which we run not so quite so regularly on um, using e-books. So um, we've more or less come to the end of this um, presentation. So um, if there's any questions, um, we're happy to answer them. There are a couple of questions uh, in the pod. Uh, Linda asked, how many modules does each academic liaison librarian support? That's a good question. <laughs> some of them support more than others because we actually work in a matrix system. So some um, academic liaison librarians do that and only one other job. And some academic liaison librarians do two or three jobs in the matrix. So for example, I do academic liaison live engagement and I'm, I also work on the inquiry services. So um, I've probably got about half a dozen modules I'm supporting at the moment. But I don't know how many do you have, Jude? About the same, I think. But then I think that there are, yeah, it depends on, yeah, as you say, other commitments. Anything between two and fifteen, probably. <laughs> That's right, Jess. And we also, um, some modules are more demanding than others, it has to be said. Yes. <laughs> uh, so the next question was from Sarah. Uh, do you find that all publishers are offering library ebooks? We have lots you'll only rent on a per student per year basis. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we have those issues as well. Um, we've, um, we, we've, we've worked with quite a few of them to change their models over the year, um, over the years. Um, like I say, we've kind of circumvented the issues with Springer, for example, not offering individual titles um, by using evidence-based access. Um, we've worked with Oxford University Press um, quite early on with Oxford Scholarship Online. Um, to actually get them to move to actually offering um, individual ebook purchase as well, and Taylor and Francis. Um, the problem, uh, like you've mentioned, we're having now is it's textbooks. Um, I don't think um, anyone's quite got their head around yet how to supply textbooks. Um, the publishers, the models they want to use are based on the student headcount um, and on a kind of annual basis. We are trying to work very hard with them. Um, I know um, my colleague Bev, who did the presentation um, just before, um, she's been working quite hard with Oxford University Press in terms of some law textbooks. And she's been working very, very hard with SAGE as well in some of their textbook offers. So we're, we're challenging some of the models they're coming up with um, to try and work ways around it. But obviously, we sometimes just have to experiment. Um, and that's very much the phase we're in at the moment. Um, we've also got a different department that purchases a lot of set books for the university. And we're trying to work with them to work out the best way forward with all of these kinds of things. Cool. Um, so the next question from Alison was, are there any of these activities that we can view? I can answer that one if you don't uh, if you don't have an answer if, if you don't have an answer ready, Fiona. That's fine, Jude. Yes, I don't want uh, the answer is anyway. <laughs> um, in terms of the learning activities that we embed in module websites, no, um, they, they are behind um, OU um, login access. But we do have shorter activities which are publicly available on our site called Being Digital. So if you just Google Being Digital, uh, there's a bunch of short information literacy activities available um, open access. Uh, so the next question from Penny, uh, we've got quite a few questions, lady. So um, buckle in. Uh, do you keep a record of which resources are embedded into which course so you can update them if a link changes or a resource becomes unavailable? We do indeed, Penny. We have something called LibLink, which um, is a, an internal thing which was developed um, in the library here. And um, anything that, um, any library content we use in a module, it goes into LibLink, so we know um, exactly what library resources are being used in a module and we can actually change the links if we need to um, in order for the link to start working again. And of course if something disappears as well then we have to then we can inform the module team and try and see what we can do to um, support them. 
Cool. So next question from Tony. Do students work through the embedded activities together at a specific time, or are they made aware that the activities are there and then encouraged to work on them at the point of need? Um, yes, they work through their modules um, individually, because uh, obviously it's distance learning. So um, they work through their modules at, um, the, uh, at uh, the pace they want. Um, obviously, they all have to come together for the assessment. but. Um, so they'll be working th uh, through an activity. So for example, with um, the Hyperloop activity, these students will work through that um, themselves when, when at the particular point in the module where they're um, directed to do it. The next question from Michelle, are the library tutorials freely available? The um, generic ones are actually available on YouTube. So you can actually watch our generic um, sessions on YouTube, and there's Introduction to Library Services, Smarter Searching with Library Databases, and um, that sort of thing. Yes, we make them um, publicly available on our library, OU Library YouTube channel. Uh, the question from Alison, uh, what advice do you have for universities who are endeavouring to convert face-to-face -face teaching to online by late September? How can we best support academics? Oh, that's a session in itself, I think. <laughs> It is, yes, that's right. Um, we are actually running a couple of um, tutorials shortly about online teaching for librarians, um, which have, <laughs> have been wildly popular and um, very oversubscribed. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to make um, videos, uh, which we will put up on YouTube for everybody to see. Well, a question from Shelley. I'm just keeping an eye on the time because we are a little bit over time at the moment. Um, but question from Shelley, uh, what is the matrix system? It's nothing to do with Keanu Reeves, I'm afraid. No, that's right. Um, it just means that um, we have a number of different um, posts, jobs in um, the learning and teaching librarian setup. And um, so there are things like um, inquiry services, live engagement, academic liaison and authoring. and um, uh, a librarian will do um, one, two, three or more of those um, particular bits of um, the matrix. So we, we don't all do everything, we do bits of whatever. So it's not so as exciting as it sounds. <laughs> it really isn't. <laughs> uh, Sarah's asked, would you be able to share an example of your content review report? Absolutely. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. I have it here now. <laughs> Oh uh, no! You, I think I think Fiona, you've got the checklist. You've got the license oh, that's checklist. Right, I've got the, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but um, I'm, actually, I will put that up because um, I've forgotten about that. Yeah. There's actually um, a piece I wrote for um, the serials uh, 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 insights, um, as it is now known, um, that I was published in. Uh, I think it was late January, early February this year. Um, which talks all about how we use the content review reports and gives some examples and things. Um, that's on, if you go into the Insights Journal, UKSG Insights, and um, look for me, Alison Brock, um, you'll find my um, piece on that and it tells you all about how we do our kind of um, content reviews. Cool. I'm just looking at the time. We do have two more questions, but um, perhaps Fiona would be able to type um, an answer in the chat uh, during the break, because I'm conscious we've got uh, 10 minutes uh, to get set up for Sarah's presentation. Um, so I think I'll call that one to an end as we are over time. Um, there's two questions there from Linda and, and a quick one from Emma, but if uh, Fiona wanted to, during the break, pop the answer into the chat while we get set up. Is that all right, Fiona? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I think Alison, or Alison might yeah. be able to answer Linda's question. Okay. And I will uh, get the next presentation set up with Sarah. So we'll resume at quarter past 